we're all a little late, right? <laughs> uh, Kelly Constantine, our clerk, Amy Hutchins, our assistant director, and Vivian Franklin, our public health nurse. Uh, and maybe um, as a lead into our discussion of metrics, um, Vivian can show us our latest uh, data, and then we can talk about how we want to go, what we want to do moving forward, what metrics we would like to see. Vivian, take it away. Oh, you're muted. But it doesn't look like it. Better. Yep. Yeah. I lost my screen share. Most disabled participant screen share. You're sort of quiet. We can hear you, but it's not that loud. It's probably your microphone. Sorry. Hmm. Can you screen share again? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Great. Can you not hear me still, though? You're it's quiet. Low. Yeah. Well, if we're quiet, I think we can hear you. All right. Is that better? Mm, not a lot, but go ahead. I don't know why. I've never had that problem with this computer. Well, let me know if you miss anything I say, and I'll repeat it. Okay. Um, so here we are. We're definitely on an upward swing in cases still. Um, it's been referred to, I think, as a, a gradual increase. It's a slower burn than um, the complete burnout that we had in January and February of this year. Um, in the last seven days, uh, between May 4th and May 10th, we had 167 new cases with an incident rate of 82 average cases per day per 100,000 people. Um, if we're going by CDC case rates, that's 571 cases for seven days. Again, I usually prefer the incident rate since it smooths things out, averages things out, and is less um, skewed by um, lack of testing on the weekend or you know some fluke outbreak event that happens on one day. So um, that was a 16% increase from our pre previous seven days. So again, sort of this gradual increase that we're seeing. Um, as for Hampshire County, very similar. Um, as far as continuing that trend, we had 770 new cases reported to the CDC for that same time period, that May 4th to May 10th. Our case rate was 479 cases per 100,000, so well over that 200 cases per 100,000 threshold that they like to use. Um, for their metrics, and that was a 34% increase from the previous seven days. Um, our new hospital admissions um, for that time was 6.5 new admissions per 100,000, and I believe that was the equivalent of 11 new admissions in actuality. Um, and the percent change in hospital admissions was a 10.8% increase from the previous seven days. Um, and 4.6% of our um, staff and patient beds are for like COVID positive inpatients. And I was speaking with Dr. Levin earlier. Um, this really is not taking into account staffing challenges that are being experienced um, by hospitals because of COVID, um, COVID absences, um, as well as hospitalizations due to other things um, that they were seeing. So our community level is medium, um, but our transmission is quite high. And here's our wastewater surveillance. I decided to include this. Um, just note that um, 
our wastewater, we have limited surveillance sites in Hampshire County, so it can be a little bit um, limited or skewed. Um, it's really following along that same trend we're seeing. Also note that um, our wastewater most recent data, and I got this from BioBot, um, the most recent data was from May 4th, so I don't have data for this week. I would imagine, based on what we're seeing with cases, we could, it would probably be very um, similarly going on that upward trend. Um, I also wanted to talk about flu and give a little bit of an update. We are having a really wonky flu season. Um, we are still seeing increases in flu cases. Um, I know I spoke about this the last time we met. Essentially, since the beginning of March, we've started this second flu season, basically the second surge. Um, our influenza activity in Massachusetts is moderate, and specifically in Western Massachusetts, it's also moderate. I think um, as, as of last week, Central Massachusetts was considered to be having high flu activity or flu severity. Um, our percentage of illness was... Um, Viv, I'm sorry, hold on a second. If you're not speaking, could you mute yourselves? There's some background noise happening. I'm not sure from where. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so the percentage of influenza-like illness visits uh, is higher than the regional baseline um, compared to previous seasons. And I'm gonna show you what our previous seasons look like in the next slides for some reference. Um, our percent of hospitalizations associated with influenza is also higher than the same point in previous seasons. Um, and, but on the flip side, laboratory confirmed influenza was reported to have dropped by 8% this week, which was really last week because I mean, this, this is the May 6th report. These reports come out every Friday. They're available to the public online. Um, we are still seeing it driven by influenza A, specifically H3N2. Um, so if we look at our previous seasons, um, in the blue, this top line here, um, that is our last kind of normal flu season. And I say normal in quotes because flu seasons can vary year to year and wax and wane as it is, um, depending on you know what's going on with the virus itself. But um, our last normal pre-pandemic flu season was 2018 to 2019. Um, and you can see that there in the blue. Uh, and then in the yellow, we have our 2019 to 2020 season, which was also kind of interesting because um, it was following a very similar um, path to the 2018 to 2019 season. And then right at lockdown, it just seemed to stop altogether. Um, and then we have our flu season currently here is our 21 to 22 flu season where we started having flu activity. And then I think Omicron just took hold. Um, and maybe people weren't getting tested as much because they assumed they had Omicron or um, they weren't going out as much because they were avoiding illness altogether. Um, but for whatever reason, we had this very um, big lull right around then. And then around March, we started having flu upticks. Um, so like I said, it's a very wonky flu season in comparison. They don't typically have increases to this degree this time of year. Yeah, our flu season usually starts around the second week of January uh, after the Christmas holidays, even though official flu season is officially, you know, early December, we don't usually see uh, much happening until mid-January and we're usually done by April. <clears throat> the last time we saw that I can remember that we saw a big um, peak in flu this late in the season is when H1N1 first came to town and it came up from Mexico in April, April, May, June. Um, <clears throat> so this is unusual. Um, and I do suspect it has something to do with either Omicron itself, some competition or whatever, or the fact that people had changed their behavior, they were cleaning their hands, they were masking, they were not gathering because they were homesick with Omicron, I mean, whatever it was. Uh, so hard to say what's causing it, but um, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, notably, I didn't include last year's season because we had a literal handful of cases for the whole season last year. Um, so there wasn't really much to show, but that's also something to note there. You know, there's some context as to what could be driving this new flu season here. 
Yeah, so when last year when we had almost no flu, a lot of infectious disease um, specialists were saying, oh, we should be doing this every fall um, because we'll have less flu. We should be, Matt, we were all wearing masks then. We're all cleaning our hands and wearing masks um, through that whole time. So, you know, should that become the norm in the fall to prevent all kinds of respiratory diseases? Do you want me to stop sharing or did anybody have any questions about how it was presented? Nope. You're muted, Dr. Levin. <laughs> um, I thought we should talk about what metrics we should be looking at. If there's anything else that <clears throat> you think we should be looking at, um, and in particular, sort of what the meaning of the metrics are. Um, I have concerns about <clears throat> the new CDC criteria, you know, this new green, yellow, red, and we're currently in the yellow of the new criteria. So in the new criteria going from green to yellow is based on number of cases. And it has sets a very high bar. And we also know that we don't capture a lot of cases, but we nevertheless have entered the yellow. So which means our cases are probably, you know, astronomical. Um, but um, the only way we go from yellow to red on this new CDC criteria is by the number of COVID admissions to the hospital and percent of beds used or number of admissions. And <clears throat> unfortunately, I, I don't, I think that really misses something and I'm not sure how to, how to manage that, how to think about it. Um, thank you. Um, but um, our hospital, as well as hospitals around the area are very, very full right now. So they have a high census, um, not with COVID, with non-COVID. Um, and yet they're having a very hard time because uh, of a baseline staffing shortage. And then you have all these people absent from work because the community levels are so high. And unfortunately the CDC metrics don't capture that issue. Um, so that's just something to note. Um, you know, if we were to decide to use those CDC metrics as something that we were really gonna go by, um, it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, and um, I don't know if we have public access to the census of the hospital. I know we have public access. They tell us every day how many COVID patients they have, but not the total census or anything about absenteeism or staff to patient ratios or anything like that. I don't know if they'd be willing to do that. Um, but I'm wondering if having that kind of information would be something that we or the public would be interested in knowing. Or for example, um, as you may have heard, there's been a lot of COVID in the schools, right? And clusters in the schools. Um, <clears throat> in the way that um, COVID just transmission, having high levels, affects our functioning as a uh, community, right? Our hospital function, our school function. Is there a way we can measure that or have that? Is that important to know uh, in how we or the public think about COVID? Um, because we know we don't have a lot of control over it. It's so contagious. And the White House has also said that their goal is not to control cases. Um, and I, I think it's short-sighted and, uh, and maybe there's nothing, uh, not a lot we can do about that now, but I think I would like to keep that on our radar that cases are important. And if we had better way to monitor them, we have a lot of home testing. We don't have good um, data on cases, but wa wastewater could, might be a substitute for that. Um, and, um, I just think that um, I'm wondering if we could find a metric for that or ask for metrics for that. And do you think that that would be an important thing to know or for the public to know? Would that change behavior? Would that entice people to mask up? Would, would that do anything? Um, or is that important or not? Any thoughts about that?
You're muted, Lauren. I sense that, that as time goes, people will test less and less. So that metric will become maybe less reliable. And I, I think um, testing wastewater is but a routine program, maybe a good alternative if it's at the city level. But I don't know how costly that is for the city. I, you know, I, I think, I, go ahead, Cynthia. No, just that, that testing of water, that's a Hampshire County test. So we don't know what's happening in Northampton. I think Meredith, you've told us in the past that it's not necessarily being tested in Northampton. It's because it's kind of costly. Yeah, currently it's not being tested in Northampton. It is costly. I think we were paying um, early on when it was more of a pilot thing, we were paying $750 a week to get our wastewater tested and um, the superintendent of DPW had made note of that, you know, it's kind of skewed because we have the regional hospital in Northampton, which is feeding into our wastewater plant. We have the VA, we have a lot of long-term healthcare facilities and we have Williamsburg all feeding into the plant. I mean, on the flip side, if we look at it, you know, it's, it gives us a better geographic kind of feeling uh, of measure of what's going on. So it's not just primarily Northampton data that's going in. Um, and then we have all the people that work in Northampton. So there's a lot of variables to it where other communities don't have similar um, situations as we do when it comes to tasting, testing wastewater. And we can't, we would have to test it from the plant. We couldn't do site selections to test it. And I forgot the reason why, um, but there was some good logic behind it. Vivian, do you happen to catch where Biobot gets the wastewater for Hampshire County? I think there's only one town in Hampshire County that they test. Does anybody remember? East Hampton, mm -hmm. South Hadley, and Amherst residential life at UMass, I believe, but I think Amherst, this, uh, the town of Amherst is also going to be starting to test wastewater. Yeah, so I guess I'm not sure that we need our own. I think what we see most from wastewater is trends, not actual numbers. And I think that's mm -hmm. probably the best we can do. Um, percent positivity. Although that relies on tests. I mean, that's we have that kind of number at the hospital. We see people in our urgent cares who are symptomatic who come in for testing. Um, hard to know how it correlates to what would happen in the past, you know, now that people are testing at home. Maybe only the ones who have a positive test or only ones with a negative test are coming in for testing. Hard to hard to know. Um, but um, I think I think what really concerns me is that just because I was at the hospital for the last couple of days and and as you pointed out, Joanne, the census is crippling and it's not COVID. Right. And so if patients with COVID start coming into the hospital and the hospital can't handle it, I think their process is to triage out. Am I wrong or would I don't and, think and, there is any I don't think we, we used to be on diversion. You know, the ERs used yeah. to be on diversion when we had too many. I don't think they do that anymore. Okay. Um, and uh, if we have a lot of patients, all the other hospitals will have a lot of patients as well. Yeah. They may not have yeah. beds. Um, I think the issue right now with Omicron, we have a decoupling of cases and hospitalizations, right? Relatively low hospitalizations, very low deaths, and lots of cases. Um, and the issue, I believe, is that um, as cases go up, cases in our staff go up because they're community members. And that's where we run into trouble. High census, you know, high acuity um, and staffing issues. It's not just a coolie, it's everywhere. Um, and that's not being accounted for anywhere. And I'm not quite sure how to how to manage that. And, and do you think that information would be important to know? Like, is that gonna change anything that either we do or the public does. Joanne, do go ahead. Suzanne, go, ahead, go, ahead. go ahead, Suzanne. Um, I, I think it's certainly of interest and a concern, 
but as you've said, right now it's not COVID linked. Um, and I find it interesting that this particular population, staffing in hospitals, has such a high rate of transmission because I would expect them to be the most informed, the, the most used to wearing masks because you still have to be masked in healthcare facilities. So while I find it of interest, I don't know what the intervention would be because if, if folks that are affected by staff shortage, shortages and mask all day at work are still contracting COVID assumed outside of the hospital, how do we convince anyone to be more vigilant than they're already being? This, this is the population of people that, sh I'm not gonna say should know better, but, but are most informed. And whatever we're doing is still not <laughs> being effective. I just so wanna, yeah. I, I just don't know. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate the, I mean, it's a great interest to me and it's been an, of interest throughout this. And it's, I think from my perspective, hospitalizations and deaths are what we should be following. I think we, no offense, Vivian, but I think we long ago lost control of, of case counting. Um, and um, so I don't have, and, I, and you've mentioned previously that it's of interest to continue to follow and I and I agree with that but I don't have faith in the case numbers but hospitalizations and deaths are far more concrete but I don't know what we do about collecting more information uh, uh, particularly about staffing in hospitals I mean I understand why the schools re-implemented masks because I think that you know kids are in school together all day long and absentee rates among students and teachers is is critical so I, I understand why they would do that but we're talking about hospital staff so i just want to make sure everyone is clear that the staff that we're talking about at hospitals are not acquiring their COVID at work that's that's what i mean they're just community members who get it from their families or or whatever else wherever else they get it and it's just that we end up having a lot of absent staff members. That's yes. what I'm talking about mm -hmm. is that they are they are acquiring it outside of the hospital. So um, whatever they are doing in the hospital is not translating to the same behavior at home. And I think that's understandable. But they are the most informed about transmission. And, and they are most affected by staff shorting, shortages. Um, when you're short on staff, you know it. Um, I, used, I used to be told, um, if you don't come in, you better be dead because uh, we'll come and kill you if you're not um, because staff shortages in the hospitals are, 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 so, um, are, are so devastating to patients and staff. So I just don't know what we do with this information. But but I, I do, I mean, whether it's anecdotal or not, I'm making a sweeping statement here, they're getting it from their kids. And so we did do something, Northampton did do something to respond to that by reintroducing the masks. So, I, I mean, I just, yeah, I mean, I understand. I just think it's, it's an indicator. It is one indicator, yeah. I, and I'm also thinking that maybe our, our framework for making these decisions has got to be sort of multifaceted. I mean, taking into consideration, I hate to call it Vivian's data, but it's the only data we have. Um, but we have these colors, right? Um, if under the old CDC rules, we might be in red right now. Um, we are. Yep. So, so, so I'm just thinking that maybe we need to think about, I'm not talking about instituting anything tonight, but what are those levels, right? What are those levels of concerns that, that we don't um, impact um, behavior in society in the way that we had to do it when we didn't know what we were dealing with? But do we start with a grocery store? Do we start with a bookstore? 
do we you, you know keep restaurants open do we start with entertainment venues i mean maybe we have these levels that we need to begin to think of which is what we did for the last two years in reaction to um, the virus, but maybe we need to have that plan in place ahead of time as whatever data that we have, and we know it's getting very shaky, but we do know this, it's increasing. And so I'm just wondering what action do we take? Do we just, do we sit and wait for the graphs to just keep going up or do we have a plan in place? Um, and it's true, I mean, it's. It, Whatever communication plan we have to have people wear masks or get vaccinated, you know, there's going to be some response to that and some pushback on that. But um, I still think it's our responsibility to do something. And I'm not saying anyone here doesn't think that as well, but I'm just curious as to how we can approach this. Um, um, Cynthia, I, I was very interested to hear you talk about um, people being exposed to, to school children. I have heard of more people becoming uh, uh, acquiring COVID in the past three weeks than I have in two years. Mm -hmm. And none of them have school children and none of them ex are exposed to school children. So I think it's community widespread. I think the schools are contributing, but I think it's community widespread. It's just so darn contagious. Yeah. As far as the metrics are concerned, um, we, as Joanne said earlier, everyone knows, we don't know where this is going. And I think it was very informative to me that Philadelphia put considerable effort into developing metrics, followed those metrics by reinstituting masks and discontinued four days later. And New York apparently had metrics for uh, implementing uh, school-based masking, they reached their threshold and decided not to do it. So I'm not sure how helpful these a priori metrics are because people are doing them and then not acting on them because the, the situation at the time where, where, where these are triggered um, doesn't warrant what they thought they were going to do. I don't think it necessarily means we shouldn't have triggers. I'm just wondering what those triggers should be because the CDC metrics, I don't think quite cover all the problems. I think Philadelphia's problem was that they didn't decide ahead of time that if they met a certain metric, they'd have to meet it for a certain period of time, and then they would keep the masks in place for a certain period of time. You know, they just had one thing, once you get over it or under it, rather than say, once we implement, we keep it for two weeks or something like that. I think that was their, their problem there. Um, but yeah, it is hard to um, decide ahead of time. But um, I don't know, since there's no more contact tracing, I was thinking, you know, our interventions should be really based on where we see problems and specific problems. Um, and like in the schools, we saw clusters happening in schools, so masks were recommended, um, but we don't really do contact tracing anymore. So we, if there were clusters out there, we wouldn't even know it. Is that correct, Meredith and Vivian? Other than the school setting? Oh, you're you're still muted, you. Vivian. Sorry if you heard that. I was testing the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, well, is this better? Yeah, yes. much better. better. My input volume was way down. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm glad you can hear me now anyway. Um, we don't do contact tracing to the same like meticulous level that we did at one point where we would literally collect every bit of information about whoever the person I contact with. I mean, first of all, that was much more realistic back at the beginning when people's contacts were like their household members. Um, 
but also it's just uh, this the state stopped prioritizing contact tracing once we had collected data about you know where people were catching this most and what we've learned recently is people are just catching it everywhere. Um, but we do reach out to a good proportion of our cases. Um, we do, you know, work with clusters as they occur and their settings. Um, but I mean, it does seem that it's just community widespread is, is what's occurring. I, I mean, I do think that certain situations really put people at higher risk. Like if they have a household member who has COVID, their risk of contracting it is so much higher than a one-off exposure, even at like a, a social gathering, um, and which makes sense. I mean, they just have a higher dose that they're exposed to. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's the volume of spread that's happening is hard to trace, but it also lets us know that it's essentially occurring everywhere. I'm intrigued with the flu data that Vivian <clears throat> presented. We don't have flu metrics. We don't have a flu plan. We just expect it to arise every year. We Nationally, we always lose more than 30,000 individuals to flu. It's the same high risk groups as with COVID. And why don't we do it for flu, but we're discussing doing it for COVID? That was actually uh, referenced in the roadmap um, that Dr. Levin sent out, discussing the differences between flu and COVID, how COVID is a crisis, whereas flu is, and all of our other respiratory bugs are expected and is COVID still a crisis? That, that's the, is it still a crisis? I would well, say. Well, the mortality um, and hospitalization rate for COVID was higher until was. Omicron, until was. Omicron, right. So now it's different. Now, now things are different. It, it's different now than it has been in the past. That, that's but but it causes other problems, as I was saying, in the functioning of our society. You know, and are we going to have enough teachers for our schools? Because it comes in such acute waves. It's not like spread out over months that people will gradually get the disease. It comes so acutely that you have so many people out at once that affects their functioning. You know, I don't know what's happening in government, but certainly in the schools and the hospitals, it's definitely affecting our function. Um, and I know, uh, well, I don't know for a fact, but I believe there are, there is an absenteeism rate within the schools for other things such as flu, norovirus, that when they hit the threshold, there is action to be taken. I know schools have been shut down in the past because of norovirus outbreaks. So in a controlled environment, you know, with a known population and known absenteeism, we can do something. Um, we can set a metric ahead of time and react afterwards. But when we're just talking about general population, that's very hard. And we have a, a moving targets all the time. Um, this, like we all know, this discussion could be very different two weeks from now or at next Board of Health meeting because of a new variant. Um, and I think I love the discussion. I think it's super engaging. I think, you know, we bring a lot to the table, but I still kind of stand by we it's, you know, we just, I think the best thing we can do is just con constantly meet, meet more if needed and discuss what the flavor of the week is at that time. I, I, I hate to, you know, spin wheels and waste time on, on something that we can't do unforeseen. So far, I, I'm not being, I, I'm, I, I mean that sincerely. We, we've approached a crisis by, um, by, by reacting to what is current information. Um, the information from experts changes over time. Everything changes over time. And, and I think we've done a pretty darn good job mm -hmm. of reacting to this for two plus years by meeting and responding to the current situation. And Dr. Levin, you know, one thing in the roadmap 
um, article was a dashboard. And I do, we do have this wonderful dashboard that Vivian updates once a week, but I think perhaps maybe including hospital census could be um, on our dashboard could be, you know, some information that the public would like. And it doesn't, I'm not talking just COVID census, but I'm talking about capacity on a weekly basis. And what does that look like? Super important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'd like to put wastewater up there too, mm -hmm. because that's sort of the most telling of trends mm -hmm. and not dependent on testing. Mm -hmm. um, dashboard. What's that, Viv? I said, I'm going to need a bigger dashboard. <laughs> I'm need a Is that a JAWS reference? Yes. <laughs> Do we have, um, again, I'm going to be anecdotal here, that um, most, and I don't, do we have statistics on this? Most of the cases that are occurring are occurring um, in the unvaccinated mm -mm. versus, okay, I'm glad you're shaking your head, versus the breakthroughs. Do we have data? Which is which? Um, our data here is going to be incredibly biased. I mean, we have the uh, the baseline statistic kind of of because we have a higher number of vaccinated people than unvaccinated people. Are yeah, we are so much more likely to see breakthrough infections. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. So our data is going to be real funky because of that. But Viv, is that one of the data points we collect when we do our calls? Yes, um, that, yeah, assuming we can complete outreach and interview the person and they're open to sharing that information with us, that is information we collect. It also does auto feed from the Massachusetts immunization database. However, as I've discussed before, that data can be um, prone to being fussy and incomplete and not feeding in correctly. Um, so we do like to make a point of asking in addition to that, not just assuming that if vaccination data is not there, then they're unvaccinated. I think the state has a dashboard on this. And I think the more appropriate statistic is to say, um, of all vaccinated people, what percent got COVID? Of all unvaccinated people, what percent got COVID? Rather than what percent of all COVID is vaccinated? Because we're going to have more vaccinated people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's just the way how you how you look at the how you slice and dice those statistics to make them make more sense. And that, that's my follow up question um, in terms of vaccinations um, here in Northampton, where we have a high rate. Um, how is that going? I mean, I hear nationally it's slowed and I don't hear much about get vaccinated. Well, we have a high number of people who are flooding into, and it, uh, it's it, that's trickled down a little bit, but it, once they announced that second booster, we had uptake really quickly. Um, and then okay. I mean, the next regional, I couldn't just off the hand, cuff tell you how many of those people, um, you know, were Northampton residents. I'd have to look at the um, vaccination data, but um, last I looked last week, um, 80% of our residents are fully vaccinated. I think 93% have at least one dose and 55% have gotten at least one booster dose, which isn't too shabby. In relationship to the rest of the country. Definitely in relationship to the rest of the country, we're doing pretty well. And I, I think, think, go ahead. That, I mean, that really does translate into better outcomes with infection. So even if they are still catching um, COVID, because it's mutated how many times since we developed a vaccine, um, yeah. there it's still translating into less severe disease, um, lower risk for hospitalization and death. And then that combined also with all the outpatient treatments we have now, there's a lot of avenues to prevent hospitalization and death. I think before, uh, I think I heard from Kate that before the second booster was announced, they were having a little trouble selling boosters um, and uh, new vaccines. Um, so it, it definitely had slowed down. Is that right, Meredith? I, I think that there's a lot of parents out there who are interested in getting their uh, six months to um, four, you know, four-year-old or just under five-year-olds vaccinated though. Mm -hmm. They're eagerly awaiting that vaccine to be developed and announced. 
Right. And there, and there is more data now just to say that if you develop COVID, uh, that's sort of like having a booster. So not everybody, people may have been vaccinated in the past, got COVID once and you know, don't feel like they need a booster now because that really does boost their immune system. Some people call those, those folks who have had both immunization and COVID call them super immune. Um, so, you know, there's some people who believe that, uh, and it, it, you know, there's some evidence that um, having COVID and vaccination is actually better immunity than having vaccine alone. So <clears throat> there's that. And that's something no, no one has been keeping track of, you know, it's not on your immunization card that you had COVID, so that counts or anything like that. That V-Safe program, that little app that we were promoting, especially when we first started giving vaccines, they do check in with me even now, you know, a year and a half since my first dose, and they do ask me if I've had COVID before. Mm. So there's some tracking of that, but it's very voluntary. You're uh, mute, aren't wouldn't it be difficult to try to determine uh, a rate among vaccinated versus a rate among unvaccinated simply because I would guess the unvaccinated is less likely to report um, COVID or be tested within a... It's iffy because um, on the flip side, somebody who is fully vaccinated may be more likely to have no symptoms or very mild symptoms and not really pay attention to them and may not get tested for that reason. So um, it, I, I, that could be an argument to be made. I will say we started collecting at-home test data and like everybody who reports their at-home test is fully vaccinated, has one plus booster doses, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I do know that the state was collecting the data on hospitalized patients on who on vaccination status of uh, hospitalization hospitalized patients. So I don't know if that's reported on their website for those patients, and that would be a less biased sample in, in a way. Um, any other thoughts about metrics or interpretation of metrics? Um, any thoughts um, about next steps? Are there any interventions where we have a lot of COVID? Although I actually am very surprised to see that in our wastewater, it, our peak is nowhere near the first, co the first uh, Omicron peak. It feels to me, given the number of people I know who are sick, it feels to me like COVID is everywhere, like, like it was in January, but by wastewater it doesn't show that it's that prevalent. So that's sort of interesting. Well, Merit, I, I admittedly didn't um, get a chance to look closely at the article. Meredith had shared with me that um, some wastewater data had reached levels um, try to quickly open it if she's stepped out, but um, some wastewater levels had reached levels not seen since like mid-February. Um, oh. mm -hmm. Well, so our peak was, was like first week in January, so we may oh. be getting up there. Um, so even if we used wastewater, which seems to be more reliable, um, is any, is there, are there any interventions that are warranted at this time? Or at some point in the future, if we continue to go up, what what would we do differently? I think well, people are reluctant to uh, to set a a bar, after, you know, over which something happens. Go ahead. I think it's what you said where the major disruptions that we're feeling right now are staffing and it's pervasive. I mean, we see it with supply chain shortages. Um, we see it with our hospitals, we see it with our schools. I feel like that is such a hard thing to address I, at a broader level. Hmm. I, I think what we can do, and I'm not saying it's different because we do do it, is focus on, you know, having people um, test often, you know, make tests available to the public. Um, they just announced today that they're distributing them to all of the licensed camps in Massachusetts. Um, testing is super important. If, you know, that needs to be a strategy that 
gets ramped up more than what's happening right now. Um, continuing with, you know, vaccination efforts, super important. Um, Joanne, we spoke earlier this week. I loved your idea about thinking about um, asking our um, supermarkets and pharmacies to offer an hour a day where you have to be masked going in. I think that should be a conversation we have with our businesses to see their feelings about that. But, <clears throat> you know, that's a place where people need to go and um, having, you know, a small period of time every single day, if they, you know, feel safer doing so. Um, I don't know. I, so, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's more about, you know, making things accessible, you know, high, high filtration masks, testing, making those available. We have plenty at the health department um, and possibly talking to our businesses, uh, essential businesses like pharmacies and supermarkets about offering a mask only hour to, you know, for people who are immune compromised or prefer to go when people are masked up. Right. The other way I was, I've been looking at this, as Meredith mentioned, is that we have people who have a lot of different points of view about how they're personally going to handle their lives during this pandemic. <clears throat> There's a bunch of people who are like going to bars, going to restaurants, no masks. That's just moving on. Um, who don't want mask mandates, don't want any other interventions. Then there are the people who still haven't left their houses. Uh, because maybe they're on chemotherapy or they have, have had a bone marrow transplant and um, they are um, really stuck at home <clears throat> trying very hard not to get this disease because they are at super high risk. Then you have a big gray area, I think, in the middle of people who um, assess their risk, try to figure out how they're going to manage, what's worth the risk, what's not worth the risk, and there's you know, this big gray area. Um, so obviously, I think it's easy to accommodate the first group who just want to go on with their lives. We're not closing restaurants. We're not closing bars. We're not closing anything, right? I think um, because we're in, the, in this for the long run, I think we really do or should be making sure we accommodate the group of people at really high risk. Um, so uh, the CDC says 3% of the US population is at significant, uh, has significant immunocompromise. Um, but for COVID, that's general immunocompromise. Uh, but for COVID, we know that everyone over, pick your age, cut off 55, 60, 65, uh, is at higher risk. So that's a huge part of the population. Um, so as Meredith mentioned, I, I would ad advocate doing some maneuvers to accommodate that population. Um, that shouldn't be a hardship for the whole world, um, but really can be helpful to that group. Um, and as Meredith mentioned, I've been thinking that um, whether we should have uh, mask only, you know, mask for all hours, like River Valley Market has it at both the East Hampton and the Northampton um, markets. And I uh, spoke with the um, manager of the East Hampton market, and I asked them how that was received, because this is long after the mask mandate is gone, right? The city mask mandate is gone. Um, and how that is received, they have a little cute little sign with a little bear on it, you know, every day from eight to nine, please, you know, everyone needs to wear a mask. And that includes the staff, uh, as well as the, the uh, customers. Um, and he said um, that even now, about 90% of the people say, thank you so much for doing this. And 10% are really bummed out and really annoyed by it. Um, but to me, that seems like, I know that a lot of immunocompromised and high-risk people are feeling like they're being left out now, uh, out of you know, moving on with their lives and be able to do what they wanna do. Um, and that's, you know, the pandemic, there's not a lot we can do about that, but maybe there's something small that we can do to accommodate those folks. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? I think you make some very good points about people who have been isolated th throughout this. I would hope that we could request this of certain businesses and that those businesses would have a competitive advantage if they had those, if they had those times, because um, 
there is a there is a population out there who's been waiting for something like this. I don't think we can require it though. Um, I, I I think we can request it, and I wish I wish we could somehow make it known which businesses were having um, that type of response. But um, I know it's difficult to favor some businesses over others. But if they publicize it themselves, put it on their door, that word would get out. And I think it would attract some people. I think people need to follow it and see how successful it is um, and whether it's um, positive for their business or negative. Dallas, were you uh, waving your hand? I was not waving okay. my hand, but I, but I do have some thoughts. Um, you know, it sounds like, Joanne, it sounds like you're, what you're suggesting here is a more equitable approach for an intervention, not necessarily a one size fits all public health response, but the acknowledgement there are different individuals that have different needs. And I think if the intention of this is health equity, I think we might want to acknowledge that if we're, say, asking or requiring, say, for example, supermarkets um, or places where people get their food to mask at a certain time, that some people may have different access to those supermarkets than others, just in terms of proximity. So I don't know if there would be a, if a competitive advantage. There might be a competitive advantage, but there are also people that choose, I think, their their food sources because that's what's accessible to them versus being able to choose another place that might be say further away or outside of their geographic area in some way. So I think if we're thinking about access and equity, um, you know, it, it, I think it's important to acknowledge that there might not be a one size fits all approach and that some populations may have specific needs and um, that, um, some groups of people may live in areas where it might be more difficult to access a, say, a supermarket that would um, mask at certain times than others. So are you proposing that we ask everyone to do it and see, and see what happens? Or are you proposing that we um, require it so that it's even across the board? I'm, I, I'm not at the point of a proposal yet, but what I'm just acknowledging is that uh, I think people live in, in people based on where they live geographically may have more or less access in terms of proximity to a space where you, there might be a requirement of masking or even a recommendation of masking or not for a certain amount of time. And that would affect um, their ability to utilize that space. I just wanted to provide that point. And also knowing what the, um, I mean, since it's just Northampton we're dealing with, I think it's pretty, if we, if we just talk about food, right, we can pinpoint what, where those places are, um, but, but it, it does get into, and, I, and I, the, the point about access too is like, you know, I always think of River Valley from eight to nine, well, like some people aren't even up then, <laughs> but, you know, so how do you make it so that it is truly accessible? Um, in hours and time, et cetera. So I think it's a good point for us to think about. Um, but there's, a, you know, like City Hall uh, can be a place. The Senior Center, we really need to talk about where that's all at uh, as well. But there are other places beyond um, grocery stores where this could, this could certainly work. Uh, for, uh... For our public, our, our city buildings, I was hoping that we could um, ask our city to model best practices, meaning above and beyond what the rules are, um, but um, have a conversation to see if they would be willing to mask when dealing with the public, um, not necessarily in their offices or those kinds of spaces or have masking hours or something to accommodate the public who would want that, um, but also to model best practices. Um, so 
Any other sites, uh, Meredith, had you um, had a chance to look at what else was considered, uh, uh, what other sites were considered essential services? <laughs> when the, uh, when we, um, back in March of 2020, they had uh, package stores were considered essential services. <laughs> um, I wouldn't necessarily include those now, but uh, anything else that you came up with? Well, Kelly printed it out for me. There's five pages and it's broken down into um, different types of sectors, um, you know, health care, energy, transportation and logistics. There was I read through them and there was really nothing more in addition to. But it did under um, food and agriculture talk about farmers markets was listed as essential services. And then the other thing I think about, especially after Dallas spoke, was um, transportation. But we can't, you know, public transportation is wonky because it, you know, it just doesn't stay in Northampton. But um, yeah, that was the other thing that I thought of. But everything else inside of the document back from, you know, April 2020 just doesn't make sense to even yeah. consider them now. On transportation, for example, our local buses, is that a countywide thing? Are there any geographic limits to that? No, not that I know of. No? Because mm -hmm. if we could get our surrounding towns to agree with us, would we we'd be able to put something in place? Mm -hmm. Is it a, a private? Well, this Peter Pan is private. Um, City cabs. Local cabs. What about our local buses? I believe there have been legal challenges to mask mandates on public transportation. Well, for federally there was. Right. But so who oversees uh, the PV, it was it called PVTA? Do you know who oversees that or who that's owned by? I think the PVTA. Is that a private company? No. Um, because a private company could make their own rules. Anyway, all right. Um, any other thoughts about uh, metrics or interventions? I guess the only other thing that I came up with is that um, for example, we are having a lot of COVID. How do we communicate that to the community? And uh, we do we recommend that people mask in indoor public spaces? Like, do we want to say that? Do we want to communicate that out? And how do we, I, I feel like we don't have a loud enough voice in the community. I mean, people sort of hear like their, oh, their friends have COVID or this or that, but, but I'm not sure we as public health are loud enough um or or sort of reaching people or are people just tired of listening um but should we have some formal recommendations and have a way to get those recommendations out i can tell you i i do put them out on um social media i put out recommendations um when we when we change the medium for example and reception is mixed um I think there is truth to a lot of people being tired of hearing it um, and the sentiment that, you know, we've been dealing with this for two years and they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, and then there are people who definitely seem to appreciate it as well and share it widely with their circles. So, I mean, I yeah. am putting out um, information on our, our socials. So what do you use? Facebook? We have and, a Facebook, we have a Twitter, and we have an Instagram. Um, our Instagram is slow growing, but it's present. We do not yet have a TikTok. <laughs> I'm not sure we need a TikTok. Um, Meredith, you know, can we use the uh, city telephone system? Can. Mm -hmm. We've done that with messaging in the past, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we should do that once a month or when things change or, mm -hmm. you know. We do put out press releases as well sometimes. Um, I know in the past we put out a press release of uh, recommendations and not a single new service picked it up. Mm -hmm. um, so when we have a recommendation, it doesn't seem newsworthy. And when we have a mandate that's 
very, very newsworthy. Mm -hmm. um, Can we negotiate with the Gazette and just have a weekly thing somewhere that says what the latest latest is? I'm not sure if we can. I mean, I well, I can definitely ask. My fear of what has happened and will happen is it's the same kind of message being repeated over and over again. And it has just become part of the environment. <laughs> I was talking to um, Viv and Kate Kelly the other day about how can we reframe the message and what does that look like? What do we need to do to get people to listen again, because people have just kind of, you know, block it out. Um, so <clears throat> I, I feel one thing that is a little different that we can really kind of focus on, even though there really isn't good data to support it is, you know, Omicron is not the same as the Wuhan, uh, got it, Wuhan, <laughs> it's been so long, and its lineages, or Delta and its lineages, and really focus on how, you know, the six foot 15 minute thresholds are no longer exist. We don't exactly know how close you have to be or for the period of time, but we do know, you know, it's, it's not just six feet, 15 minutes of time. Um, so we've been thinking about that, like how to craft that and where do we, how do we put this message out? And we we're thinking about doing an op-ed. What really works with my prevention team is every single month they have an op-ed that the Gazette puts out and it's really well received and we get a lot of feedback from it and comments on it. I would love and, you know, not just and I know we've talked about this, not just for COVID, but, you know, as the board, we can be putting out some type of information on a monthly basis, highlighting something. That's and one of the things I was getting at with sort of framing what's going on with COVID as how it affects the community, right? Absenteeism um, and affecting our hospitals, affecting our schools. I mean, sort of put it in context of how our, our community is functioning might be another way to put it out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and if that, as you were uh, segmenting the populations, Joanne, the, the most vulnerable, um, you know, those folks, probably are not going to get their information from some social media outlet. So um, the Gazette might be the place where we, we reach those folks. And, and so our messages need to be audience driven. And also the, um, from the diversity perspective, this is like so wonky to a lot of people. And so how do we, how do we use language that's accessible? Um, so I, I think we have some communication work that we can do in this area um, because we shouldn't, I, I know people are getting the, the, the fatigue of the messaging, but that doesn't mean we stop it, right? I mean, we have to continue, so. I, yeah, I, I think that is really important to consider the audiences and the communications message in general and what audiences we're trying to impact. And is there, is there one audience? Is there, is there a broad approach to multiple audiences or are there specific audiences that we're trying to get a message to? And I think that would determine kind of the strategy and tactics of how we try to have a message uh, transmit to that audience and actually be picked up and understood. So how do, we, uh, how do we find out how people get their information? How do we, how do we know that? Cynthia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what the, you know, um, consultants and marketers are. Market all, analysis. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I know the Gazette knows who their readers are. And, um, you know, I'm sure they must know who their readers are. Um, <clears throat> but when we get into social media, it's really hard to say. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's capturing a huge group of people, but I'm wondering who they are in this um, journey of COVID, you know, a parent versus a worker versus, you know, and, and a younger individual. So um, it really, <laughs> we just have to, I mean, I like the way you separated the three categories, that huge gray category is, is one that we shouldn't ignore. Um, but we do, 
I mean, I think it's I think it's progress if we say it's the vulnerable that we really want to focus on here, um, and that helps tailor our, our our audience and our messaging appropriately. But um, we have all these diverse populations that we need to think about as well. And um, I hope there's people in the community that can help us with that. Well, I wasn't thinking that we'd focus only on the um higher risk as far as communication i also would like to reach those people in the middle who are trying to assess their risk and trying yeah. to decide you know what their behavior is going to be depending on how they assess their risk um so that's a big group i think um yeah that q a approach often works like you know are you vulnerable at school are you vulnerable at work and then you kind of do that answer um so people don't have to spend the time to read an article. They just go with the frequently asked questions, the question that pertains to them. And knowing what that particular question is is something that we could strategize around. So if we were to um, do something like a monthly article in the Gazette, the way Hampshire Hope did, if they allow us to do that, um, would everybody be willing to sort of pitch in? We could rotate? Um, and work maybe with Meredith to uh, craft something. Yep. All Meredith, right. Meredith, does that overstep your prevention team or does that appropriate? Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, I'd, I'd like to talk to the Gazette to see if we can have a set time every single month where they would publish for us. Um, no, I don't think it would step on any toes with the prevention team, it would only enhance the work of, you know, the, the health department and what we do. So we're not going to take their spot. We're going to no. have their our own spot. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be my hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do we want to talk a little bit more about what our, our current message is <laughs> uh, that the six feet 15 minute doesn't really apply indoors or doesn't apply at all? Um, that COVID is airborne, um, that if you're going to wear a mask, wear a quality mask. Um, is there anything else that's sort of newish um, that we would want to include in our messaging? Testing. The tests are made available everywhere for free. Um, that the health department has tests and masks available? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, I include information about available outpatient treatments that people who are at high mm -hmm. risk for severe illness should contact their provider as soon as possible if they have COVID because that treatment's time sensitive. Right. And what just came out um, through DPH about oh. the telehealth? What? Yes. Yes. Oh, right. And I did put that out on our socials. Um, you can get free COVID telehealth if you are um, in that eligible group. So if you are high risk because you have a high risk underlying condition, or I think if you're over 65, um, I could be wrong on that, but um, you can go online to mass.gov slash COVID telehealth and you can get um, free consultation online and free um, prescription for Paxlovid, which is an antiviral and that has to be taken within five days of illness. Um, you also have to be symptomatic and you have to be 18 years or older. So really great service. Um, yeah. and also available to us Western mass people out here in the land of dragons, Boston didn't forget about us. So um, it's good. I, what I was trying to find out is if you are determined to be contraindicated for some reason for Paxlovid, um, I don't know if they, inform you about other treatments um, or- other I would suspect that they do because those other treatments are available through the state, through Gotham. So my guess is that they would, yeah. Yeah, I did try to find out about that, but I couldn't find an answer. Any other particular messages that you think are sort of new and exciting? And just as a, a question to someone to help us, I, I've been a little disappointed, Meredith, in the Mass Association of Health Boards. They haven't really helped us at all, have they? I go on their website to see if there's anything that they're helping us with, and it's there's just not nothing there. Have, 
is that a possible resource for us? Um, well, Cheryl, who works for MHB, is a resource, and she has been uh, helping all of the boards of health, 351 <laughs> boards of health, for the past two years constantly. I don't think she's slept in a couple of years. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, um, she's very responsive. Anytime I've reached out, and now you know the big pushes are push right now is shared services agreements between um, health departments. Okay. And they're facilitating that and they're going to be doing the capacity assessment um, starting in three or four weeks and they're putting up job descriptions, you know, um, so they are, they're there, they do okay. their presence. I think it's just kind of um, behind the scenes a bit more. But no communication assistance that you know of strategies and audience no, no. messaging. Okay. Mm -mm. What I get asked about um, is if things that we assumed um, were already out there and people were aware of, for example, where do I get tested? Yeah. Um, um, when should I get tested? Um, what's my risk if I'm already boosted? Should I get the second booster? Um, those are the kind of questions that, that people ask me. Um, and you can say, well, you know, go to, go to the website. That's not very helpful mm -hmm. yeah. to yeah. people. So uh, I, I think we might want to rethink reviewing basics first. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's still very nuanced though. <clears throat> and that fears me. I, I would prefer if someone has questions and I hate saying this is to call the health department or email the health department so we can have a conversation because um, some of it gets lost in, in, in the messaging. It's not really, it, it's clear as mud, right? <laughs> um, so we, we, we put it up there too and we try to make it a little more digestible when we put it out than you know, the state or the CDC. Um, but use the health department as a resource. I think they're mistakenly thinking that by talking to me, they're actually getting an informed resource <laughs> about this. So <laughs> <laughs> I trust you. So that's important, right? Oh, that's important. Can be misguided, you know. <laughs> Meredith, do you feel that the responsiveness of the health department, you know, the five eight seven, whatever the number is, that we're we're back on track with that? That that's oh, a hundred percent, Cynthia. Okay. Um, with, with the exception of Kate Kelly, because she is still out and about, you know, five six days a week doing clinics and managing that, but. Um, you know, Vivian is super good at relaying the information that the admin team of the health department can relay and answer questions to. So we've got it going on pretty well there. And, you know, what my, the admin staff is not comfortable answering, they'll definitely direct them to the right person so they don't speak out of turn or, or provide misinformation. So great. Mm -hmm. We, we do get quite a bit of phone calls from people who are seeking guidance on like what to do for isolation and quarantine. That information and the guidance around isolation and quarantine has evolved so many times and so drastically every time during the course of the pandemic. I mean, there's people who still think that they have to test out of isolation or isolate until they've gone like three days without symptoms. And then they have to take a test. Like there's all kinds of variations of what they yeah. think is going on with isolation guidance. And um, I really no fault to them because really the only place you can find that information really reliably is on the mass.gov website um, and not really anywhere, you know, in paper or right. not being broadcasted on any like 24 seven channel or something like that, you know, it's only on the website. I do believe 211 also fields questions still regarding uh, testing, Q and I, clinics. Okay. It, it's amazing how many people don't know about 211. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. That's, that's a whole public relations campaign in itself. Ah, mm -hmm. and it's, it's great for individuals that are, you know, don't have a computer. Or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just mm -hmm. Dallas? 
Yeah, I was just also thinking, if we're thinking about the Gazette, and obviously op-eds are limited in the amount you can print, but it, some people may look at this at one time, other people may not pick it up at other times, some people may see it online, but it may be <laughs> worthwhile to follow kind of even the same formula in a way of like, here's what we know, here's some basics, here's some options. I was just thinking about the stages of change. And while a lot of people may commit to change for some factor in their own personal life, some people may read some of the new data that is there in an op-ed and that may, you know, that may convince them to commit to a change, a behavioral change in some way. So it it might be useful to, to start with at least some type of, here's the data, here's, where you can get help and here are some initial maybe new interventions or new responses um, because it seems like we've talked a lot about interventions but maybe not something that would spur behavioral change i have found the uh, calculator for quarantine and isolation on the cdc website to be very helpful and to direct to direct people to because it's customized to your own situation. What, what was your exposure date? When did you have symptoms? Um, this is the date you can um, go out in public. And of course, the, rec the strong recommendation to mask, but, but that's been very helpful to people. Yeah, and there's still a lot of cloth masks around, right? Even that one basic, uh, as I understand it, mm -hmm. it's not a helpful thing to wear a cloth mask. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so next steps. Um, Meredith, you can check in with the Gazette. You have a relationship with them already? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. That would be great. Um, so I've taken some notes on some of these messages that may be new for some people um and we can get some articles going do we feel like we want to put something out on the uh on the telephone that reaches a lot of people doesn't it meredith do you know um you have to sign up for it you sign up for it and how you'd like to receive your message i'm not sure like and we get a report on um who picked up how long they stayed on so it's interesting um but I'm not sure how many residents and or businesses in the city are actually signed up. And you can, you know, you can send a message out by geography too, which is pretty cool. And yeah, um, I'm just taking a note of my task. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do have school committee meeting that I have mm -hmm. to go on. Um, mm -hmm. They're keeping me posted on how public comment is going right now, if it's coming to an right. end, so. <clears throat> Uh, all right, before you leave, do you want to give us an update on the Mosquito Aerial Spring? Did the um, City Council vote on that? No, that is on the agenda for the 19th. In preparation thereof, I started the application today, so I'm almost done with that. So I'll have that ready if they decide to um, make a vote to opt out because it is due on the 23rd. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, um, Will you have an opportunity to update us on the departmental reorganization at a future meeting? Oh, yay. I was hoping that someone would ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in case well, you haven't heard. <laughs> wait, we have departmental updates on that on our new business. Go for uh, it. Fantastic. So um, over the past few months, I've been speaking with the mayor and the mayor's chief of staff about reorganizing the health department, which I feel is long overdue. Um, we have transitioned from when I took over the health department 10 years ago to your basic health department meeting, basic health department needs, which were inspectional services and monitoring and surveillance for communicable disease. Those were kind of the two functions of the health department back then. And uh, we had, we had um, an equivalent of three full-time employees. Um, it was a very small staff in one room and how we've grown, not only how we've grown size-wise, but the types of services that we provide and also to whom we provide them to has grown. So um, I 
pitched to the mayor, um, thinking about us more of a model like uh, Department of Health and Human Services. And, you know, the previous mayor supported that was just kind of getting to the place where we could do it. And the new mayor also supported that. And when we were having discussions about that, we talked how nicely the Department of Community Care would fit under um, the umbrella of a Department of Health and Human Services. So um, by executive order last Thursday, which was the, I don't have the date and I don't have a memory to recall that date really fast. Um, the mayor went in front of city council and, and um, uh, um, spoke about the executive order she wrote for two, there were two orders, one restructuring the Northampton Health Department to be a Department of Health and Human Services and elevating the health department, uh, the health director's position to a health commissioner's position. So that was one executive order. And then the second executive order was to put the Department of Community Cares underneath the um, Department of Health and Human Services, which was actually initial, an initial ask of the, that came out of the police commission report. So it's, it satisfies that needs need. And it also really um, helps support the implementation director that they hired to stand up the Department of Community that cares. Um, he, uh, Sean Donovan is the implementation director and he didn't come with experience in municipal government and procurement law and how to navigate the systems. He comes with a special skill set in, you know, peer, you know, um, peer to peer response and, <clears throat> you know, uh, social services, but to apply that into building a department was challenging and he was struggling a little bit. So I was happy to assist and happy to provide him infrastructure and a team so he can take his vision and actually, you know, move it forward. Um, so with that being said, on May 19th, we're having the hearing at city council, um, which I unfortunately won't be at, but um, the position, the person that I am appointing as the assistant commissioner of the DHHS will be Michelle Fari, who you all know and have met and I think adore. Um, once this is finalized, hopefully on May 19th, she will be the assistant deputy commissioner to me. And um, then we will have six divisions underneath the DHHS with four directors and then staff underneath them. So <clears throat> right now I'm in the process of um, finding some more space for our staff. Um, I'm looking at some suites right above the Peter Pan bus station. So I'll, if, um, if everything goes through, um, we will put our DCC team in there and our prevention team and um, I will move there and so will Michelle, and then we'll keep our health department team. So our nurses and um, sanitarians and Kelly in the offices that we have right now that we currently occupy. It is my um, hope and vision that within the next year or two, we find a space that is large enough that can house my entire team and also be very connected to the Resilience Hub. And mm -hmm. speechless. <laughs> it's pretty, it's really huge. And if I could just, um, Meredith and Joanne, I don't know if you remember when I was on the Police Review Commission and we were three months into COVID and I said to both of you, we're kind of leaning toward this being in the health department and your the looks on your faces were like, no, 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 no. this is never going to happen. <laughs> So it did. So thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a big job. It's a big job. It's a big job. I'm, ex I'm so excited about the possibilities um, and what we can do with this, having this overarching umbrella. Um, I, you know, there are models out there with other um, departments of health and human services where they absolved the um, Board of Health. I have no intention or 
want of that happening, I feel like the Board of Health still has a place and um, anything outside of public health, I feel like you will act as an advisory committee to me. So I, you know, I super support keeping you guys doing the job that you do. Um, and um, I hope you guys feel the same. I think this is a real testimonial to your leadership and confidence in what you and the rest of the department can do. This wouldn't have happened without that. And so kudos to you and all your staff. Thank you, Suzanne. <clears throat> I would be lying if I, you know, didn't say I'm, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> This is this is a big job, um, but who wouldn't be? You know, this is this is a huge undertaking. But I'm not scared of hard work, and I have complete confidence in the staff that I have. Um, and we have, you know, throughout the years, I, I, just the people on my team, their dedication to our mission is outstanding, and that. You, that doesn't reflect on any resume or the pay that they get. I, they are just amazing people and hard workers and loyal and extremely dedicated. And I would not even consider this without them. Well, congratulations, Meredith. It's okay. well-deserved and best of luck in this Thanks. new position. Thank you. And won't it be great to not spend all your time on COVID? <laughs> <laughs> That's the real reason why I took this. <laughs> Just one operational question. Do you think we would be working with the assistant commissioner as we have worked with you in the past? So I plan on being your main point of contact through you know, this transition, at least for a year or two. I think eventually it will be the director of environmental health, which is kind of what we see as our health department. That is, um, and that would be Amy Hutchins. She is moving up as director of environmental health and will oversee inspectional services and public health nursing. So, but, um, uh, for in the meantime, you know, year one, year two, I plan on being your main point of contact and help with the transition and being part of, you know, part of this all the way. And again, I see you acting as an advisory council in many ways of, you know, work that kind of falls outside of, you know, that strict public health umbrella. You all bring um, such value and skills to the table. I would be stupid not to utilize them, uh, saying that frankly. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I don't want us to need to step out too far out of our usual roles. No, of course. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the, the, the DCC is really focusing a lot on mental health. And I, I think that still is part of our purview mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about health. But mm -hmm. um, we're Right. We're policy people. Mm -hmm. They remember smoking. Um, so, you know, it's hard to know where this will lead us. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by statute, you couldn't make a regulation or policy that focuses on mental health. But yeah. 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 <clears throat> well, so, great. That was my great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do we want to approach a senior center vaccination policy? Can I just speak one more time? Do you mind if I step off and go to the committee meeting? Uh, is there anything else you want to address? Um, anything else you want to contribute before you go? No, Amy's on. She knows okay. she has the pulse on um, senior center. Um, ventilation. I don't know if you're going to talk about mm -hmm. ventilation, but yeah, mm -hmm. she, can, yeah. she can take it um, over. Just Meredith, just really quickly, you know, I'm the advocate for whenever we have a vacancy on the board, whatever you can do to speed that up, that would be great. Sure. Well, yep. Lauren's going to make his formal announcement. Go for it. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 
Just wanted to tell the board, and I know you're aware of it, that um, today would be my last day on the board. Um, it is not an uh, easy decision, but um, I am relocating to the Boston area. And um, there's a variety of professional and personal factors and will no longer be a Northampton resident. So um, I'm really sad. It's been a, a great four years doing this. This um, um, it was a, a, an honor and a privilege, and I um, am a little sad to leave this position, but uh, I know that everybody is in good hands, and uh, you've all been amazing throughout, and uh, I'm sure you'll find someone to replace me that um, can uh, be on your team. Well, we've so appreciated your work um, and, uh, and who you are, and... Um... It's really been great working with you and we wish you so much luck and um, I'm sure you'll contribute uh, to whichever community you end up in. Yes. So. Ditto, Laurent. And um, if you need a recommendation for someone to, you know, who's really good at reviewing minutes, <laughs> I, I'm there for you. So thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Thank you, you Laurent. We'll miss you very much. Thank you. It was nice getting to know you. <laughs> All right, uh, let's tackle the Senior Center vaccination policy. We talked about it a little bit last time. Um, and Amy, do you wanna talk about, um, I guess you did a, a survey? Yeah, we did a survey. Um, it, there was three questions, um, looking for feedback regarding the vaccination mandate. One question, uh, masking indoors, kind of a, a little broader question, doesn't have to do with the mandate, but to get a feel for the, their uh, members community. And then if they hadn't returned to the senior center, the, the whys. Um, so similar to the River Valley feedback, it was about, you know, 90%, 10%, 90%, 89.1% um, they liked the policy. And then uh, not exactly 10% didn't, but that portion of it, a lot that that portion of it was the didn't like it and a lot of different feedback. Um, masking was a little bit different. Uh, there was about 42% that felt more comfortable when they, when they personally wore it. And then about 31% um, would feel more comfortable if everyone wore it. And then 14.9, uh, like a wide variety of um, thoughts on it and some no comments and, and things like that. And then um, as far as not returning to the um, senior center, there are a lot of reasons um, out there. There was about 10 pages of, it was like an open comment. Um, you know, their programs aren't available at this time. They're busy doing other things. Um, just a, a lot of different varieties. So that, that was hard to really base that on. To give you some idea of how many we got back, that we've, um, there are, uh, we've checked in a little over 600 members in. Uh, just a reminder, we have uh, public health ambassadors there every day uh, manning a table where um, the first time you come in to the senior center, they just ask to see your, uh, that you're fully boosted. So it, it can be on their card, it can be on their phone, it can be on a piece of paper from MIIS. Um, they look at the paper to make sure that they're just not vaccinated, that they're fully um, vaccinated with that booster. And um, they, they put their name in, they put the date that they came in and who checked them in. Very, very simple information, not what type of vaccination or anything like that. Um, so again, we've checked in a little over 600. Once you've been checked in that way and provided your proof of record, um, typically the health ambassadors, if they recognize them, they just wave them through, good morning, you know, go on in. Um, they might not recognize all of them, some wear masks, and then that's when they just ask for a name, they look for their name and say, oh, go right in. Um, so Again, about 90% are just do it and are very comfortable at, you know, in that process. And about 10% are probably, they're just a little angry <laughs> or, or frustrated or you know, don't know why we're there. Um, that's our feedback at that desk. Um, so out of the survey, so out of that 600, we did it electronically and we did it um, by paper and I made a QR code. I tried to do as much as I could to, you know, prompt their responses. And we had about 309 electronic 
and about 22 paper. And um, basically how I uh, just gave you the responses is, is where it landed. You got 309 back electronically? Yeah. Electronically. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. I know. <laughs> so 90% like the vaccine mandate. They did. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, it, 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 absolutely. And the official internal senior center policy about masks is what? There, when we lifted it as a community, they lifted it as well. Okay, okay, thank you. We think that this intervention is effective. of continuing to check vaccination status. Since we know that so many people who are fully vaccinated are acquiring the current variant and spreading it, are we giving people a false sense of security that they're being protected if they're not wearing masks? There were some comments to that question. So, you know, some, some feedback to that. What that was um, brought to the attention of the survey as well for feedback. Any other thoughts? I can add, which has nothing to do with um, the policy itself. Um, Staffing the table is, is it's not easy. Uh, I don't know how sustainable it is. Um, so again, has nothing to do with policy, but just kind of letting you know that piece of it. And there's, there's somewhat of a, um, I'm not sure who's uh, overseeing the senior center. They have, they're in transition, Right, there's um, a search out, I think, are going to be put out. And um, so it's hard to try to talk whatever, whoever the leadership is there, right? It, it, that's very true. Very so true. It's, a, it's like a group of people? It, it's there, they have staff. Um, they just, they lost the, the director. I believe they lost the assistant director. There's an appointed director. Um, they don't. You know, they they're kind of hands off on our on the table itself or check in. Um, they're just, you know staffing their programs and things like that. So to Suzanne's question, I just put this out to everyone: Are we? Is it a false sense of security, or is it a sense of security? I mean, from a from a public health standpoint. Is it overreach or overkill? Or if the majority of the people feel really good about it, I, I'm just wondering where we go with that. How many people like turned away from being checked and turned away because they don't have that proof? Um, is, it, is it a one once a day occurrence or zero day occurrence? It's not once a day, but it has been where they've been turned away. They missed the missed the information that went out, you know, several times through the senior center and newsletters and and things like emails. Um, and they just didn't have their card with them. And then they come back and they bring their card. But there there's a, and I, I don't have like the exact number, but um, there's probably a good handful that um, are not that are not boosted. I feel like that that's the piece. They're vaccinated and then have either been advised by their doctor not to get boosted or choose not to get boosted because of their side effects, um, some things like that. So they can't, they turned away because they're not boosted, right? Is that the... Yeah, because then it, uh, that, it was defined in the, in the, um, in the policy that uh, fully vaccinated was with booster. In so, our written written public comments in the past, we have gotten comments from uh, one that one or maybe two people who wanted to use the senior center and for their personal reasons didn't get vaccinated and couldn't use the senior center. So there are some of those. Mm -hmm. So 
from a public health perspective, if tomorrow we suspend any carding, will there be any measurable difference in people getting sick or dying as a result of stopping the carding? It's the question. If the answer is no, then we shouldn't be carding. was mentioned in public comment, it's the only building in town for which that requirement uh, currently holds. And they lifted the mask mandate when the mask mandate was lifted for other buildings, yet the vaccine uh, mandate has been continued there without the mask mandate. It, it just doesn't seem consistent to me. To be perfectly honest, and, and again, it's something to think, and I'm, I'm on my way out, but I would redeploy those ambassadors to think about, you know, the, te the mental health of teenagers as opposed to carding senior, senior citizens. <laughs> Going back to our communication plan, I think uh, encouraging the wearing of masks in the senior center would be advisable. Okay would be advisable, but I'm not sure. I, I don't believe that continuing the, the vaccine mandate um, is an effective intervention at this time. So any more uh, discussion or does someone want to make a motion? Well, isn't it how we feel about, I've, I'm not making a motion here, but um, drop vaccines, but in state, Mask mandate? I think we can make a strong recommendation for them to wear masks and to point out that everyone who walks in the senior center is at increased risk, but I think they know that already. There's, there's such a high proportion of people 65 and older in this community who've been vaccinated. It's what, 97, 98%? Um, they're aware that they're at high risk, and I think that we can recommend masking. I, I would not flip this and institute a mask mandate while lifting the vaccine mandate. I, I, I think that that would, um, that we would get tremendous pushback from that. Well, I understand that our health department has a big supply of masks. So, Amy, can you bring some KN95s there and distribute them to anyone who walks in with a cotton mask or a surgical mask? Yeah, we've been doing that, actually. And right. um, mm -hmm. because we received a supply also from um, because of the, the amount of vaccine that we had on hand, we were able to get some more tests. So we just recently brought some down there um, as they're coming in, it, they can as needed, take two tests as well. So we're trying to give them, you know, those measures. Sure. I think we could, like, we if we're not there to do that, we could certainly then hand them off um, to the senior center as well. Yeah, I'm not sure how the health department ever got roped into uh, manning that table, but. Yeah. <laughs> we do everything. Oh. <laughs> you do it all. What's needed? Are you, looking, are you looking for a motion? If someone wants to make a motion. Uh, I move to um, lift the vaccine mandate for the senior center. Is there a second? I'm going to second it. Any further discussion? Uh, I'm sorry. I just, um, it, and the reason we're lifting it is because it is not protecting our senior citizens or the, the people who work and use the services. I just want to be clear. Is that the reason why we're lifting it? Because the protection is not required. So 
not as protective against the current variant as, as it had been previously. The effectiveness is, is less than it had been and gives people a false sense of security that they are protected. I think what you're saying uh, it's efficacy in trans, um, decreasing transmission, right? It's still Correct. protective against severe disease and death. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Transmission, which is why I assume we had it, we implemented it in the first place was for transmission. And then the, in keeping with the line of thinking about transmission, we are not prepared to say mask mandate. We prefer to say um, optional. That's the outcome, right? If you we say don't recommend it. I would recommend it. I, I would not mandate it. And and I'm just, I really am not trying to, I, I, and why would that be, Suzanne, just to help me to think through this? Because I, uh, how do we justify uh, reintroducing a mask mandate in one building in the city. Um, once again, it's the, only, it's the only building in which we would have that requirement and seniors go all over town in the, into buildings all over town. And I thought we the earlier discussion centered on making recommendations for people who are at high risk to wear masks, but not, not mandating it. I, I, think, I think there will be the same pushback that we got earlier about, um, you're not gonna let me use this facility if I don't have a mask. Is that what you're telling me? And um, I, I, I don't think it's worth it from, from a prevention standpoint or from a policy standpoint. The other thing, I was just going to add one other thing is that the other thing to remember is that masking from two years ago is really different from masking now when people are wearing KN95s and N95s where one-way masking is, uh, is protective. It's not 100% and it's better when everyone masks, but it is much more protective than it's ever been. Thank you for that, Joanne. And this doesn't um, conflict with some of our earlier discussion about seeing what we can do about um, having mask requirements, certain hours for uh, different businesses. Are we just talking out of both sides of our mouth or? I thought we were going to request, I thought we were going to request, not mandate. We're um, going to request businesses do that. Sure, sure. But does it? Um, does it conflict with that line of thinking? It would still be our recommendation. I would recommend seniors to wear masks indoors all the time. Yeah, Whatever. there's also also a question about what's what are essential services where people really need to go and what are elective yeah. services? Yeah, yeah. And we have a very high vaccination rate among the elders, very high. So, I mean, originally, one of the reasons I liked the mask mandate was one early on, it was protective, um, but also it encouraged them to get vaccinated if they wanted to use the senior center as a way to encourage vaccination, but we really have a very high vaccination rate. Thank you for um, the discussion. Any further discussion? We have a motion on the table. Um, all right, we'll bring that to a vote. Um, I'll go around my screen. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Uh, Suzanne? No, you're muted, but I know what you said. <laughs> I said yes. Uh, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Uh, Joanne, yes. Uh, so that... Um, the senior center vaccination policy uh, mandate has lifted. Um, that will occur immediately. Um, and uh, how should we communicate that? I can communicate. I can communicate that to 
I'll um, reach out to what, who I think is the appointed interim um, and get that message to her, certainly. Um, the, I can get the message to the public health ambassadors um, and figure out the best way to, you know, get them the supply of masks and how we're going to do that. So, uh, yes, great. Thank you. So communicating that the mandate is lifted, but also that we strongly encourage that people using the senior center because they're a high risk group, that they wear a high quality mask that fits well with high filtration, um, that they have ready access to testing. Um, again, that they don't come to the senior center if they have any new sniffle or sore throat or, or respiratory symptoms. I mean, we can sort of, I can help you craft that that message if you'd like. Um, and jo Joanne, just uh, just a correction on this. We use this term high quality, but um, you know that could be my grandmother made this cloth max. I mean, we just want to probably get a little more specific. Yes. And and yeah. Right. That's that's Thank my you. shorthand for uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. N95 KN95. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you all. Um, uh, anything else on this subject? Any last words? Anything else? Um, I just want to give a little update about ventilation. Um, we had a first meeting um, of our newly created ventilation task force. That's Amy Hutchins and myself, and a UMass professor who's uh, named Rick Peltier, whose uh, specialty is air pollution, um, and uh, a volunteer that we found during both the public comment. Thank you, Lauren, um, Josh Yearsley. Um, and we had a first meeting, and I think we're all on the same page of really wanting to educate um, the board, our city councilors, our public, our businesses uh, about uh, ventilation, uh, how COVID is transmitted, how changes in ventilation can be helpful, um, and different ways to do that. So uh, they're in the process. Uh, Josh volunteered now to um, create an educational PowerPoint. And it actually, he's not a ventilation specialist, but his specialty actually is in uh, taking complicated topics and making them uh, understandable. So we'll see what he comes up with for an education. Um, and I'm hoping that for our June meeting, we'll have a presentation for the board. Um, and then um, we're gonna meet again in a couple of weeks and sort of figure out our next stops, uh, you know, for this, um, education that we'll take on the road. So I'm very excited about that. Um, anything else um, on ventilation or any other old or new business that anyone would like to bring up? And then we'll get to minutes and schedule. Yes, Cynthia. Um, just on the communication issue, we've talked a lot about communication. And since we will be down a board member and it's difficult for us to to communicate amongst each other. Um, I just I, I'm only throwing this out here, but maybe we could have a subcommittee that um, works on this issue. Maybe with prevention people. I don't know, but if it takes um, you know one or more board members, it can be made public. So mm -hmm. um, just so we don't lose the momentum in this mm -hmm. direction. And I think Meredith said prevention folks in prevention would would like to work with us. And maybe it's only one of us and working with them, I'm, I'm not sure, but I just mm -hmm. want to throw out different scenarios and we don't have to decide that tonight, but mm -hmm. just acknowledging that it takes time to recruit a new board member. Yeah, so I'll touch base with Meredith. She was gonna um, talk to the Gazette um, and ask her how she might wanna proceed and maybe you and she would sort of come up with a laundry list of different, um, communication uh, pieces and locations and um, we'll sort of take it from there. Sort of yeah, sounds work good. on that. Yeah, great. Um, okay, uh, minutes. Did everyone have a chance to talk, uh, to look at the minutes from April 21st? Any comments? I have once, I have no uh, corrections or suggested edits. Um, I would like to add a sentence, though, under um, the third bullet, uh, under new business, about the ventilation and air quality projects. First sentence is that Amy discussed 
the focus on small business restaurants and bars. And then Dr. Levin spoke to the mayor's office who's gathered a group from various sectors to discuss how to distribute money from, I, I would like to add the board favors using some ARPA funds to support ventilation and air quality projects. I, I, I'm not sure that that's clear from those two sentences. Thank you. The board favors using ARPA funds to to support ventilation and air quality projects. I don't know if we have to insert some ARPA funds so that people don't think we want the entire. <laughs> that would be nice, but I don't think that that's actually what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. So some okay. ARPA funds. Okay, Kelly, do you have that? I've got it. The board favors using some ARPA funds to support ventilation and air quality projects. Okay. And actually, as part of our ventilation task force, we're going to pursue sort of how to make our preferences known to that group that's going to be distributing the ARPA funds. That would be great. Thank you for doing that. Great. Any other uh, edits to the minutes? Do I hear a motion? Motion to approve the minutes sure, second. with the change uh, provided by Susan. Bye. Second. Any other discussion, comments? All in favor, Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. OK, thank you all. And now for our calendaring which is now a verb. Um, we, had, um, we had discussed a meeting on May 23rd if we needed to. Do we need a meeting on May 23rd or the next time we had allotted was June 23rd? Is that right? Is May and June the same? May 26th is two weeks from today. Um, no, not two weeks. Ago. Yes, two weeks. Ago. We had, yes, we changed the day of the week because of people's schedules. So if we had needed an extra meeting to about two weeks would be May 23rd, we had agreed on. But the otherwise um, for June, we had talked about June 23rd. I guess We're we need some. Oh. Go ahead. I guess we need something between now and June 23rd, whether May 23rd is the right one or not. But it's still fine with me. So now one, two, three, four, five, six. So that uh, June 23rd is six weeks from now. Do we want to meet in two or three weeks? You still get to have me if it's May. <laughs> <laughs> let's jump on that yes yes do you want to keep it on may 23rd i think there was some problem with may 26 i can't remember what it was i'm, I'm okay with may 26 it was me was dallas was dallas were you away uh, that that was me that yeah. was your conflict right okay the 23rd is a monday um so, hmm. so Dallas, you can make the twenty third. I can. It will be. It will be tight, but I'll be able to make it. I. I may have to um, zoom in now from my office, but I can make yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, the twenty third is not great for me now. And Dallas, you said the twenty six was not great for you. Are there any other days that week? The twenty fourth or twenty fifth. Uh the 25th is the best day for me personally. Can everyone else do the 25th? I see Cynthia shaking her head. Well, um, I, um, I'll do what I have to do. I have to cancel something. So. Does the 24th work better? Or? No, no, it's okay. It's all right. 24th doesn't work for me. 25th? Cynthia, are you willing to do it or it's up to you? Yeah, we, could, all, we could go another week. It's all about Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> we want Lauren. 
Twenty uh, fifth, Lauren. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so we're down for the uh, May twenty fifth instead of the twenty third. And it's five thirty. Still a good time for everyone. Suzanne, is this a tight schedule for you still? It is not a tight schedule for me now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And we don't know about Meredith's availability. Um, All right. But I can check with her. Um, we could also, you know, send out if that doesn't work for her and we want her here, then um, we could send out another notice and try to work on another date. And after that, for June the 23rd, does that work for everyone? I think we had said it does. Um, yes. So our regular scheduled is the third Thursday, which is the 16th, but that did not work for some people. So we're on the 23rd. That was, that a, I'll be out of town, but I can, I can uh, call into that meeting or I can zoom into that meeting on the 23rd. Okay. Do we want to talk about the summer? July 21st would be our regular schedule. It's available for me. And if things are really quiet, we can always cancel, but it's good to have it on the books. Available Anybody for else? Uh, can you say it again? Sorry. July 21st, third Thursday. Uh, I may be on vacation, but it's a little iffy right now. So sorry. Why don't you just schedule it? Uh, is the 28th better for everybody? 28th is okay for me. It's okay. That's okay for everybody. So you want to yeah. make it the 28th instead of the 21st? Okay. Okay. Um, August regularly scheduled would be the 18th. Any problems? No, often we don't have an August meeting. All right, we can always cancel if things are quiet. Anybody else? Okay, Dallas, Cynthia. Good. I'm good with that day in August. Okay. And Joanne, just to yes. let you know, Meredith is good for the May 25th Wednesday meeting. Her calendar looks good. Oh, good. Everybody can do that. Okay, great. You texted her. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly's on um, it. Kelly, Kelly can't unmute. So we're <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, great. Um, we'll check in with her also about the... Uh, 28th of July, but we have time for that. Okay, anything else? I think that's good for the moment. Anything else anybody has? Quiet group. <laughs> Who knows where we'll be then? Right, right, right. Okay, so our next meeting is May 25th, which is about two weeks at 5.30. Be there, be square. Lauren, good luck. We'll miss you. You'll be back. Oh, you'll be, you'll be there in May. Excellent. <laughs> Suzanne, you didn't announce your retirement, did you? <laughs> retirement from what? My job or the board? <laughs> your job, because you can make the 5.30 meeting with no sweat. Uh, I'm now no longer working on Thursdays. <gasps> so you're easing into it. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the, the Monday meeting is going to be, the Monday the 23rd is going to be tight for me, but, oh no, actually, yeah, that'll be tight for me, but I'll make it happen. It's the 25th. It's not the 23rd. 25th? May. May is the... May is the 25th, which is a Wednesday. Thank you for that. Yep. That's, yeah. Wednesday's different. Thank you. You need to retire. Excellent. I don't, I can't retire. I know. I, know. I, I, I just can't for a lot of reasons. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. We, we we'll, need to make a motion. Oh. oh, yes, please. Someone want to make a motion? Um, motion to close the meeting. I second. Oh, sorry, Dallas. <laughs> uh, any discussion? 
All in favor? I'll go around my screen. Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Great. Joanne, yes. Thank you all. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Kelly.